the kind of second phase of this drawing really is so much about building up the values into a place where the drawing will be prepared to be finished. I think it's very interesting and very critical and sometimes maybe very misunderstood what we have to do, what our responsibilities are like in this moment of the drawing. We should have by this point a clear set of planes established. We should have at this point a good sense of accuracy, structure, proportion. These things should be dialed into the drawing by now. The thing that we need to do then is go through that kind of laborious process of building up evenly the value, crafting and honing the values that we're applying to these different planes so that by the time we come to really and truly render the form, that we have enough value that the drawing will make sense from a shadow and light perspective and then the rendering can kind of sit on top of that. Taking a look at the cheek for instance, we see the entire side plane of the cheek and that is one value that is depressed. We have a secondary plane that represents the up-facing lighter plane of the cheek. The values that take place in between those two planes are what I would consider kind of modeling or, or a place where the modeling of form would be necessary. Whereas maybe those two first initial kind of large planes that I described, that's something I think of as more just kind of establishing a sense of dimensionality in the drawing rather than refining the drawing. The values inside the linear structure of the drawing should be a little bit softer in relationship to one another. On a hierarchy from very soft to very hard, almost all of your drawing is going to take place down here at the bottom of that scale. So the very hard edges that we are going to preserve, really usually for kind of the edges of contours and things, should have a very clear and easy way to kind of differentiate themselves from the more softer turning values inside the form. So let's just take a look. If we kind of go from the top of the forehead here down to the edge of the jaw here, most of the edges in between values are really, really soft, with the exception being some of the harder edges around the more faceted kind of features of the eye maybe some of the more uh, faceted features of the nose, and certainly the contour at the edge of the cheek. All of the meetings of value shapes within that face, for the most part really, are within that range of very soft values at the bottom of our kind of edge hierarchy. I'm starting to kind of darken down some of the shadow edges, and this is a technique that I use to try to enhance a little bit the sense of the impression of the light kind of popping out or kind of coming forward a little bit more. And it's something that I do for a series of reasons. One is that those shadow edges are a very rich kind of place to take your, your design from. Uh, so the idea being that a shape is a little bit more easier to control and to design if it has maybe clearer edges. You can think about, for instance, um, a contour of the face being a little bit more easy to design than say some of the softest half tones of the cheek. We all struggle with creating structure in those very, very soft shapes uh, and emphasizing these edges to the shadow is one of the things that makes a shadow a little bit easier to control. The key to this process really is comparison. The hope is that, in a way, no choices get made in your drawing without a series of kind of cross-references. And I don't mean, of course, to make drawing sound like too dry of an exercise, but we need to be, at least up to a certain extent, quite rigorous in the way that we question ourselves or question the application of graphite to the paper. Anything that goes into this drawing is entering into a context in which it is creating a comment. And if we have too many things in that context that are, say, non sequiturs, things that don't really relate to um, the information or the things around it, we're going to be in a place where that sense of realism is diminished. And um, I say it this way also to point out that this idea and these ideas that we're working with do not have a sort of hard and fast end point. They are flexible in the sense that you can choose how many non sequiturs you would prefer in your context. In fact, this is, I think, what is commonly referred to as a kind of style that an artist will have. If, in fact, those non sequiturs or those artistic choices take on a majority share in the representation, 
I think that they can constitute a kind of aesthetic or a kind of visual choice that um, marks out that artist's work as something indicative of them and their idiosyncratic choices. So I don't want to put a kind of qualitative label on rational drawing versus maybe finding things or choosing things that are made emotionally or without a rational purpose. This can be great. If we're merely representing the world around us, and maybe even that is selling a little bit short, so many realist painters would, um, would bristle at the idea that I say we are merely representing nature, but excuse my uh, turn of phrase, just to say that um, if our only goal is to make our drawing resemble the world that we're making that drawing of, then at this point it is almost entirely rational choices about the addition of information that should guide our process. Coming to the end of this stage of the drawing, uh, there are a series of good questions, I think, that you can ask yourself as an artist. One of which is, do I have everything described at the same level, or at least reasonably at the same level? Which is to say, are there parts of the drawing that are left behind from previous stages? And if so, is that a part of the design of the drawing? Or is it something core and integral to the drawing that I have failed to sort of push forward along with the rest? 